The next topic that we're going to focus on will be membrane transport. So how exactly do molecules make their way across the cell membrane from one side to the other side of that cell membrane? Well, the method that they use to cross the membrane really depends on the properties of those molecules. So to begin, let's focus on nonpolar and small molecules. So remember, the cell membrane consists predominantly of a hydrophobic region. So the entire core of the membrane, this entire red section, is hydrophobic nonpolar because of the presence of these hydrocarbon tails, part of the phospholipid molecules. Now, because a nonpolar molecule can easily dissolve in a hydrophobic nonpolar solution, what that means is if a small nonpolar molecule wants to make its way across the cell membrane, all it has to do is dissolve inside that cell membrane. And this process by which a small nonpolar molecule will move down its concentration gradient from a high to a low potential through the core of that membrane by dissolving in that cell membrane, this is known as simple diffusion. And to demonstrate this, let's examine the cell membrane of the cells found inside our lungs. So inside the cells of our lungs, we know we have a high concentration of carbon dioxide inside and a low concentration on the outside. Conversely, we have a low concentration of oxygen on the inside, but a high concentration of oxygen on the outside. Now, both carbon dioxide and oxygen are small nonpolar molecules. And what that means is these two molecules will have no problem making their way and dissolving into that hydrophobic red core of that membrane. And so these oxygen molecules will naturally move, spontaneously move from a high potential concentration to a low potential concentration from the outside to the inside. They will pass and dissolve inside and through that membrane. Likewise, these carbon dioxides, being nonpolar, will also dissolve and move through that membrane via simple diffusion, but they will move from the inside to the outside down their concentration gradient. Now, what about if the molecule is polar? So what if it has some type of charge? So for instance, let's say we're looking at ions. For instance, we can look at sodium ions, chloride ions, potassium ions. We can look at calcium ions and so forth. Or we can look at char uh, molecules that don't have a charge, yet they're very polar. For instance, sugar molecules. Sugar molecules are large enough and polar enough to not be able to pass across the membrane via simple diffusion. So in this case, if a molecule is polar and large, for example, sugars and sodium ions and so forth, they will not be able to simply dissolve inside that hydrophobic core. And in this particular case, they have to use another method. And what they use is these integral proteins, transmembrane proteins that exist inside our cells. So we have one integral protein shown here and another one shown here. Now, these are also known as transport membrane proteins because we find the proteins in the membrane and their function is to transport, move these molecules across the two sides of the membrane. Now, we can categorize, we can break down these membrane proteins, transport membrane proteins, into two types. We have membrane channels and we also have membrane pumps. So let's begin by focusing on membrane channels. So let's suppose we're going to focus on a specific type of ion, let's say the sodium ion. Now we know that on the outside of the cell, we have a higher concentration of sodium ions than on the inside of the cell. And what that means is, if we did not have this cell membrane, these sodium ions would move down their electrochemical gradient from a high electric potential to a low electric potential. And this is essentially analogous to a marker moving from a high gravitational potential to a low gravitational potential in the following manner. So essentially from physics we know that because there's a positive charge on the outside and a negative charge on the inside, there will be an electric field that exists across the cell membrane. 
And so this electric field that points this way from the outside to the inside will create, will exert an electric force that will try to pull on these sodium ions. So let's focus on this sodium ion here. So we have a force that is exerted on this ion. Let's call that force E because it's the force due to the presence of this electric field. Now, by the second law of motion, we know that if this is the only force acting on the sodium, then it will move in this direction. The problem is, it's not the only force. We have this barrier, a hydrophobic barrier, that will not be able to, or that the sodium ion will not be able to pass across. And this is analogous to the following situation. So, we have a barrier, the hydrophobic membrane, that prevents the sodium ion from actually moving down its potential gradient. In this case, we have gravitational potential gradient, so from a high gravitational to a low gravitation, but it can't move because of the presence of this barrier, the hydrophobic core. So, what we have happening is, we have another force that points in the opposite direction, the force, due to the presence of this hydrophobic barrier, let's call that simply FH. And so these two forces point in equal and opposite direction, so they're equal in magnitude, they point in opposite directions, and so this marker is not going to move in the same way that this sodium ion is not going to move because of the presence of the hydrophobic barrier. That sodium, because it contains a full positive charge, it cannot dissolve in the nonpolar hydrophobic core. So, what these membrane channels do is, they essentially create a passageway in that membrane that basically doesn't contain that hydrophobic core. And what that means is, what that channel does is, it removes that hydrophobic core so that now, that marker can move down its gravitational potential in the same way that the channel creates this passageway that doesn't contain the hydrophobic regions anymore and so now it moves down its potential gradient. So we essentially remove that force that existed due, due to these hydrophobic regions. We remove that force, we only have the electric force so now these will move down their potential gradient from a high electric potential to a low electric potential. Now, because these channels essentially create these passageways that essentially lack the hydrophobic core, what these channels do is they facilitate the spontaneous diffusion of these ions, in some cases molecules, down their electrochemical gradient. So, this type of transport is known as facilitated diffusion. And because they don't use any energy molecules, for instance ATP molecules, to carry out the process, this type of transport is known as passive transport, so it doesn't use any ATP. So, let's summarize our results. So, we have certain ions which contain full positive or negative charges and molecules which are very polar or large, these cannot move across the cell membrane because they cannot dissolve inside the hydrophobic nonpolar region of that membrane. Now, channels are essentially these passageways that allow these ions or molecules to move and bypass the nonpolar core of that membrane. So, they can cross that cell membrane without ever interacting with that hydrophobic core of the membrane. So, in this particular case, we saw that all the sodium ions can spontaneously move down their electrochemical gradient just like the marker can move spontaneously down its gravitational potential gradient from a high to a low. We have this barrier, the hydrophobic core that prevents the movement of those sodium ions just like my hand prevents the movement of this marker down its potential gradient. And channels essentially remove that hydrophobic core and allow those ions to move down that passageway that does not contain that hydrophobic core. And so what that means is, this type of movement is known as facilitated diffusion. Now, since channels move ions and molecules down their electrochemical gradient, no energy is actually used, and so what that means is, this mode of transport is known as passive transport. Now, we have many different types of examples of channels 
that exist inside our body. And two examples that we're going to focus on in future lectures will be voltage-gated channels and gap junction. So voltage-gated channels are used by our neurons to basically create that action potential, while gap junctions are used by, for instance, our cardiac muscle cells to create this forceful contraction of the heart. Now let's move on to membrane pump. So what exactly is the major difference between membrane channels and membrane pump? So both of these types of uh, both of these types of transport membrane proteins basically move large and polar molecules. But the difference is the channels do not use energy and they always move down their electrochemical gradient from a high to a low potential. But uh, membrane pumps actually use energy to actually move these molecules against their electrochemical gradient from a low potential to high potential. And this is analogous to basically moving this marker from a low potential to a high potential. So this marker will never by itself spontaneously move from a low to high potential. To actually get it to move from here to here, I have to take this marker, move it along this line, so I have to apply force, I have to move this and do work, so I have to transfer energy. And in the same exact way, these membrane pumps utilize energy to move these ions and molecules against their electrochemical gradient from a low to a high potential. And because they use energy, we call them active transporters. So this type of mode of transport is known as active transport. So <clears throat> unlike channels, pumps utilize energy so the energy can be the energy stored in the chemical bonds of ATP molecules or some types of pumps can also actually absorb light energy. So we have these pumps that utilize energy to move ions and molecules across a membrane and they use energy because they have to move them against the electrochemical gradient from a low potential to a high electric potential. And so these pumps are known as active transporters. They use these ATP molecules and energy to actively move these molecules against their electrochemical gradient. <coughs> now, <coughs> there are two types of membrane proteins. We have, uh, we have two types of membrane pumps. So we have membrane pumps that use ATP molecules as the energy source molecules and they use them directly. And these are known as ATP aces. So pumps that utilize ATP directly, hydrolyze ATP, are known as ATP aces. We also have membrane pumps that we call secondary transporters or co-transporters, and we'll discuss these and what they are in just a moment. So let's begin with ATP aces. So let's suppose we take the sodium ions one more. So we have a high concentration, a low concentration, electric field lines basically point in this direction. That means the sodium ions want to move naturally from a high potential to a low potential. But now we're looking not at a channel, but at an ATPase, a pump that uses ATP. And so what this does is, it uptakes an ATP molecule from the inside, it hydrolyzes that ATP molecule and that creates a conformational change in the structure of that pump. And once that conformational change takes place, it basically forces a sodium ion to move against its electrochemical gradient from the inside a low potential to the outside a high potential. So the pump actually uses energy stored in the chemical bonds of ATP and moves the sodium against the electric field lines against this electrochemical gradient. And so that's exactly what a pump is, an ATPase. And we're going to look at many different types of examples of ATP aces. So two types of examples that we're going to look at are the P-type ATP ace and the ABC transporter, which is also an ATP ace. Now, all types of pumps are energy transducers. And what that basically means is they transform energy from one form to another. So in the case of ATP aces, they transform the energy stored in the chemical bonds of ATP into the energy stored in establishing that electrochemical gradient. So we see that membrane pumps 
are responsible for actually using ATP or energy to create, establish these electrochemical gradients. And then the membrane channels use these gradients to basically move these molecules spontaneously from one side to the other side down that electrochemical gradient. So we said a moment ago that we have two types of pumps. We have ATPases and we also have secondary transporters. So really briefly, what exactly is a secondary transporter? Well, a secondary transporter is a pump that doesn't use ATP directly. What it does instead is it uses the electrochemical gradient of one molecule to move a second molecule against its electrochemical gradient. And, and, and an example that we're going to focus on are the lactose transporters that we find in E. coli cells. Now, of course, we also have many different types of um, secondary transporters that we find inside our own cells of the body, as we'll see in a future lecture.